The following program is sponsored by the Jelinski Advisory Group, which is solely responsible for its content. Josh Jelinski is the president of Wealth Quarterback, LLC, a registered investment advisory firm located in New Jersey. Registration is not an endorsement of the firm or its representatives by securities regulators, nor is it an indication that the advisor has attained a particular level of skill or ability. Investment advisory services may only be provided to clients in jurisdictions in which the firm and its representatives are appropriately registered or exempt from registration. You should not assume that any discussion or information contained in this broadcast serves as the receipt of or or as a substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor. Different types of investments involve varying degrees of risk, and there can be no assurance that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, or product, or any non-investment related content made reference to directly or indirectly in this broadcast will be profitable. Equal any corresponding indicated historical performance level or levels be suitable for your portfolio or individual situation or prove successful. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investment advisory services offered through Wealth Quarterback LLC. Tired of losing money in the stock market roller coaster? Frustrated with the government taxing you into oblivion? Worried about inflation? How do you prepare for so many financial uncertainties? Welcome to the show that will help you develop your game plan. The Financial Quarterback with Josh Jelinski. Josh is a noted financial advisor and president of the Jelinski Advisory Group. And he's here to answer your questions. Call into the show at 800-321-0710. 800-321-0710. 710. Now, let's kick off your financial future. Here's Josh Jelinski. Hi, everybody. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback with How to Retire on Dividends author Tom Jacobs. He is the partner and investment advisor at Huckleberry Capital Management. And he co authored a book with uh, a guest that we had a lot of fun with uh, before, Brett Owens. Uh, called How to Retire on Dividends. So, Tom, describe your background in the financial industry. Well, I got to say right off, bread is the fun one. So you got me now. Uh, My financial background, well, I started investing when I was 12, uh, and I never thought I would do it professionally. About 23 years ago, I got the opportunity to do that, and it's really been absolutely fantastic to uh, analyze stocks and uh, help people achieve their financial goals. Great. And your book, How to Retire on Dividends, I asked Brett this, but we had such a good time. We have you, thought we'd have you on. Um, uh, and nice. having having a different <laughs> uh, perspective might be good. I asked him the same question. <laughs> but I find, as someone who does this for a living, I would love to find that, you know, unicorn stock, not like $1 billion company unicorn, but I mean that stock, like, think of like Verizon back in the day. It would go from $50 a share to 60. It would pay a very stable 5% dividend, almost like an annuity that would preserve its principal. But then what happens, you put money in Verizon and now it's 35 bucks. So you might've lost 40% of everything you earned and you're trying to retire on dividends. How do you overcome that as an investor? You know, that is such a good question. Uh, and it's something that I really work with when people come in the door at Huckleberry. I have to explain to them that you're here for high yield or you want capital appreciation. It's very difficult to do both. You can get yield and capital appreciation, but not high yield, right? So I try to get them to understand that they need to be income focused and they just have to accept that there's going to be a lot of volatility. If they are planning on selling, you know, Verizon at 35 or something like that, uh, you know, three years, five years. I mean, they won't know what the price is, right? But that's a mistake. They really have to know that the yield will be consistent. The stock price is maybe not. See, your answer was totally different, but it was equally good. So that's, <laughs> you know, I kept trying Tell to push him. I, I, I kept trying to push them. And I'm going to keep pushing you on this. Because to me, and then we were going on on ticker symbols and stuff like that. So right. anything we talk about, we're not recommending you buy or sell it. We may own it in portfolios for clients. You may own it. So we're not trying to uh, 
persuade you to buy these things and we're not telling you to sell them. But, you know, I could just think of how do you do that, though, and not lose everything? You know, like I think of everybody used to like Anna Lee or or business right. development companies that I'm going to try to be vague, but not mention specific names as much as I can. But mortgage <laughs> REITs were hot yep. and BDCs were hot. And I could list, you know, ticker symbols from Anna Lee to PSEC to... You know, it doesn't really matter the ticker, ticker symbol and you buy it at $10 a share and then it goes down to six. So I liked your idea. This is a long term portfolio. We're doing this for 10 years, not for 10 minutes. That That's actually a good, good way to persuade it. But how do you know a company's not going like not giving you a dividend because it's trying to like liquidation. I think of Pitney Bowes, right? Like yeah, right. <laughs> it's a great stock for dividend, right. but it's like been, you know, trying to catch a falling knife and the stock keeps falling, but it pays a good yield. So like, how do you distinguish? I mean, obviously, you know, business, like I think of an Iron Mountain. Okay, that's a viable business for the next 10 right. years. But I think of Pitney Bowes, I would say Pitney Bowes, like as a consumer of Pitney Bowes, I think they they have a better product than stamps.com. So it's like if, you know, but Wall Street doesn't like Pitney Bowes. Right. You know, you nailed uh, at least three huge points about how you achieve high yield there. I mean, I, I'm sitting here like jumping up and down, right? Uh, and I, let, let's let's look at the mortgage REITs and the BDCs for a minute, because I think that that's essential uh, to understanding. They are not all created equal. And as you know, like with Annalie, people go, oh, wow, 11, 12 percent, you know, whoa. But there's a lot of risk that comes with that. The mortgage REITs, you cannot count on them, first of all, to raise their dividends, like, like a lot of really good, solid brick and mortar REITs, right? So that's one. And they can cut them. They will go up and down. But I, what I found, uh, particularly in March and April of 2020, was that if you get kind of hybrid ones, that is. Maybe they originate some of their own mortgages, like Penny Mac, right? Uh, or Arbor, Arbor Realty. Uh, they've got some other parts of their business. Then you look how they performed in really, really serious dislocations. Like when people are getting margin calls. I mean, when when the Emirates are getting margin calls left and right, and you're like, oh my God. Um, and I look at March again in April, 2020, I also want ones that are doing agency mortgages. I mean, who knows if the government would come through if the mud hit the fan. But there are things you can do to reduce your risk. And the last thing is uh, you want management that's been doing this for 10 or 20 years at least because they've been through everything, right? And also, one last thing. I mean, you got me excited with mortgage REITs. The, one last thing is I certainly wouldn't, you know, you need enough to get you the high yield, but I certainly wouldn't do it for more than 20% of the portfolio. Wow. And so you, you, so if you invest in mortgage REITs, those are real estate investment trusts that own mortgages. Um, you want ones that originate their own loans. Well, uh, yeah, one of their businesses, not not that all their mortgages are that. No, that they have like they buy mortgages. Right. But they also have some other businesses like uh, Penny Mac um, services mortgage. So they have more mortgage servicing rights. So they have they're not just 100 percent Emery's. That just makes me a little too nervous. No, that this is great. So which mortgage REITs, we're not recommending you buy or sell anything over the airways. What do you like now? What don't you like? What would you, what, what yeah, cautions? I, I have to say, like, Arbor Realty Trust is just first rate. Uh, they do multifamily. They buy multifamily loans and they also lend to multifamily. Uh, proven management. Um, I mean, okay, right. This is this is how much well they handled March 2020 and April 2020. Their next dividend, an increase. 
It wow. didn't affect them. They had hedged properly. They managed their risk. Uh, they weren't over leveraged. Um, you know, they're, you'd have to pry that out of my my hands. Plus, uh, their stock's kind of on the low side right now. It's actually, you could actually see some capital appreciation. What about people say, well, I'm looking at the chart. March 2020 went down to like four bucks. Yes, but what happened? Right. I, <laughs> I know this is why, Josh, this is why you've got, you know, I, I tell clients, I said, listen, you want high yield every X years, you're going to get a week like that. But look at the chart after that. And they kept raising their dividends. So you know, wow. your uh, my clients, we reinvest their dividends until they're ready to use the income, right? For like, you know, for retirement. And they're they're reinvesting at, at the rate of 10, 12, 13% a year at $4. Wow. Um, you know, within a year, they they were absolutely fine and beyond. You but I, I'm just so glad you said that because did I have a nervous night? Yeah, three hours maybe. Um, to be honest, but you just, it, it was like, okay, here's the example. When, uh, when the, uh, Gulf oil spill happened, all the, uh, offshore drillers got killed. Right. But some of them are really good companies. They had new stuff. They had the blowout preventers. You just had to hang on tight. And, you know, uh, as, Look, everybody likes to quote Buffett, but he's right when he says, if you can't take a 50% drop in your stock, you shouldn't be investing. Just don't sell. Yeah, I think when it comes to retirees doing this, though, or something, let's say you put it, have a million dollar portfolio, you have to be okay with that portfolio conceivably going down to 300,000. But that's the risk of high dividends, I guess. Well, you know, it, it's, I wouldn't say... Remember, Arbor's just one of the portfolio, and the the overall. Uh, I'm not sure it was even down the overall model. I don't think it was even down a third from the top because yeah, again, no, I would say uh, I don't know. We have a high dividend por portfolio. No, it wasn't seventy percent, but um, I don't know. Some of those dividend pairs got rocked forty, fifty percent, thirty percent. Yeah, oh, they definitely did. They definitely I would did. say if you hedged it well, maybe 25% decline in the in yeah, March but, 2020. Yeah. So I had a $2 million client, right? I got a successful businessman and he had 20% in high yield with me. And he said, Tom, when is this going to recover? And I said, well, first of all, your yield's going to be consistent, which, you know, I had to hedge that, but it was. The yield did not change. Some companies cut a little, some kept raising. But I said, eh, 18 to 36 months. And he was he was at his pre-crash level uh, in 14, 15 months. I was a little surprised, actually. And that it wasn't because I'm a genius. You just had to hold no, on. No, yeah, no, we, we had some high dividend. It was, it was funny. Ours was, I don't know, it took a year to, to, to rebound. And then the, they yeah. were like... Um, so uh, one thing, so what do you do when you're looking at these particularly, I think of BDCs, do you, do you um, look at them the same way? Do you want to see cash? Like if you're looking on Yahoo Finance, what's a sign that you look at to say, okay, this company is at least well run? Okay, with, well, man, there are a lot of, a lot of good points there. Yeah, I mean, I you can unpack it for like 10 minutes. I don't, I, yeah, right. <laughs> I throw like 10 things at it once. I'm not really. No, no. Well, you're right there. I mean, you have to understand, I talk to a lot of people who are not nearly as knowledgeable and skilled in this area. Well, as you I are. love dividends. I love dividend paying stocks. And to me, they're the ultimate annuity, right? Yes. But I find that. And this is why I like having Brett on. I find that listeners will buy something. Something happens, some external event. Like I remember, you know, I had this sweet client who loved BP forever. And then she sold out of BP at like the wrong, you know, in the middle of the oil spill. I said, what are you doing? BP is not going to go under. And oh, but they cut the dividend and, you know, and, and that was probably one of the most epic times to buy BP was 
after that yes. oil spill. But yes. I find that retirees, now we do things to hedge and have asset allocation strategies along with yield to kind of smooth the ride of that investor so they can handle the volatility. But you're right, though. A lot of people, that this isn't their expertise, and they think they're, they're you know, I'm going to buy some PSC and G or something and be okay for the rest of my life. And then they, it's not something you do on your own generally. You really do need an investment advisor because you, you get wigged out of the stock at like the worst times. <laughs> wigged out. I love that. <laughs> right. And, and Josh, as, as, Hard as we try, and as much as we understand the client, and no matter how much preparation we do, you know, and so on, when they're scared, they're scared, right? And they just make the wrong decisions. Now, I was pretty lucky in the in the crash, um, but I I should not be, I shouldn't say this. But I have this one client who is a friend for a very long time, who's always my contrarian indicator. Whenever he wants to sell, it's the bottom. So, for example, he sold his house in the real estate debacle out of disgust. And, of course, it was the bottom. And uh, he wanted to sell everything in May 2020. And, I, you know, it, it just there's nothing you can do. We are joined by Tom Jacobs, a wonderful guest. Uh, How to Retire on Dividends, co-authored the book with Brett Owens, We'll give that book away to those of you who call us right now at 888-988-JOSH and request your no obligation review. That's 888-988-5674. The website is howtoretireondividends.com or you could buy it wherever books are sold. Also check out Tom's work on investhuckleberry.com. This is a lot of fun. Call us 888-988-JOSH. So, okay, we're talking about how to retire on dividends with Tom Jacobs. A whole lot of fun. You're like a different side of the coin with Brett Owens. You're both equally great to interview. (laughs) And it's a lot of fun. So, folks, get the book, How to Retire on Dividends. We have a live studio audience on Clubhouse, YouTube, chat. If you have a question for Tom Jacobs, uh, he's he's been with Motley Fool uh, for a number of years. Now he's with Huckleberry Capital Management. Uh, So much insights already. So basically, how do you protect? I'm I'm asking this a third way to try to get as much from you. You're going to try to get me. (laughs) How do you how do you protect yourself from like the liquidation trap of the high yield stocks? Like when do you know, Okay, you like Darber, you don't like, you know, Pitney. Maybe you don't like Pitney Bowes because it's you know, trends down. Do you look at, I mean, I look at technicals and fundamentals, but like there are good, I have some new, new rule that I've created. And by the way, as you develop over years, I'm sure you, you develop new rules. Like, so one of my rules is like, I'm not buying anything if it's under $10 anymore. I'm not going to fall, fall into that trap because it seems like no matter how good the story is, it's like, boom, you know, um, there's one stock I love that's like a dollar fifty right now. Steve Cohen is one of the top investors in it. So that guy is not gonna lose money. Another in my mind, you know, another guy who <laughs> ran the bank, it's a bank, sold his old bank to TD. They have a similar management structure. Like to me, it's a no-brainer, but you know, it's never there's always risking, right? You know. But if you bought that stock last year at three bucks, it's a dollar fifty now. And it seemed to have an unfortunate name where people confused it with the other bank that went under. So um I noticed that you're not you're not saying that. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk, but um, you know, if I was one of those newsletter writers, I I'd have the, the perfect story, you know. Right. Uh Steve Cohen is the investor, you know. Uh is a lead investor. The management team sold the TD for a high amount. But again, like who would have thought that that $3 stocks now, I don't know what it is right now. It might be a buck 40. But the whole point is how do you uh, protect yourself from the liquidation trap? What are some specific things that our listeners can glean? Like just maybe they're not financial geniuses like you. Uh, Net income, debt, 
cash on hand because a lot of these like let's say mortgage REITs they have a lot of debt on hand so like they do you can't necessarily look at okay that company has a lot of debt so it's a bad so how do you balance that there are a couple things if you're going to own a mortgage REIT you don't want to be paying more than book value right uh, and you don't want leverage to be more than 20, 30 percent. I mean, Brett and I have a rule of thumb that we really want leverage to be manageable, you know, no more than 30 percent. And this really matters with the closed end bond funds, uh, because the reason that they pay more is that they lever up. Right. And as long as the leverage is, uh, you know, manageable Let's say you get a March 2020. I hate to keep harping on that, but that was the real test. Uh, you get a March 2020, and the, for, a, for a period of time, the value of the bonds you hold drops, and you're going to get margin calls. And, you know, you don't, you don't or if you don't have, uh, if, if you don't have, and you want to be able to have the capital structure to handle it. And we found that uh, all the companies uh, we owned that had man uh, the CEFs, the closed end bond funds, did just fine uh, because they had, you know, they had plenty of room. Closed end bond well, funds. And then we'll give, if, if everybody stays on to the end of the interview, we'll give you the top 10 categories, I guess, to look at. I mean, one, one tip I would say is position sizing. Have no more than right, so right. much percent in any one category. So... If you have a high dividend portfolio, I don't know what your rule of thumb is, um, five or 10 percent in any one category. You know, so if you build a high dividend portfolio, 10 percent in closed end bond funds, 10 percent in telecom, 10 percent in whatever covered call ETFs, 10 percent in mortgage REITs, 10 percent in real estate. I don't know. Do you have any rules of thumb like that? Well, definitely not more than 20% in mortgage rates. Yeah, but I would agree I with that one. Concentrate uh, uh, a bit differently. So, for example, I'll, th I'll include all the REITs together and say 30 to 40%. But within those REITs, there are different categories. So to, to call it all 40% is not really how I think about it. For example, I don't own any office REITs. And that wasn't just because I, you know, saw COVID coming. I just not my thing. But um, and then about uh, 30 to 40 percent in the bond CEFs, but they're widely diversified among types of bonds. And then my high yield stocks, I don't have anything against telcos. It's just I just don't happen to own any right now. I, I, uh, I have a I have a regional bank in Cleveland and a, uh, a shipping um, shipping company and, and they uh, these are things I'll own till the day I die, probably. But my point is, yes. Do I have position sizing? Absolutely. I have no one security that's more than 4%, unless it goes through the roof, and then I'll hold it for a while. But I don't want to get, I don't want that much risk in one position. So what other metrics do you like? Like if, if I'm new to this, and I want to go to Yahoo Finance, and I type in a tipper, ticker symbol, what am I getting? What am I looking for? Okay, first of all, for the for the bond fund part, the uh, the non stock, well, the non REITs, right? For the closed end bond funds, you go to CEF Connect, right? CEFConnect.com. <clears throat> and you want everything to be at or below net asset value. You don't want to be buying anything over net asset value because you're paying more than a dollar for a dollar's worth of assets. And that's easy because they will tell you right there in black and white uh, what the net asset value is and what the price is. And anyone can do that. So that's number one. I would say you do need, I mean, it is self-serving, but you should have an investment advisor who specializes in this because you're just, it's too, it's too much of a job. There's like so many different sectors, you know, one right. sector might blow up. Um, like think of telecom, right? Like who would have thought, okay, the reason why you're probably not in it, I'm assuming, is like Starlink could come and just obliterate, you know, the entire. I mean, who would have thought, you know, Verizon, you know, cratered and AT and T cratered and all those big no, names. You, exactly, exactly. Uh, fortunately, Brett was never really high on them, and I, I just listen to Brett. I just do whatever he says. No. <laughs> so oh. different ways in which. 
a regular person can look up some metrics uh, right. to see. I, I, so like, for example, at and I mean, the reason why I kind of knew that to get out of at and before it just obliterated was it wasn't doing anything for a while when we owned it. And then they just kept having debt. And personally, I always thought the guy who like took them over, you know, always burned through companies. I mean, not no disrespect to that gentleman, but it just seemed like, <laughs> you know, they, they just seemed to buy these things and then just obliterate them. Might be a better value now, to be honest, now that they've segregated discovery out of it. Uh, but yeah, for example, like, let's say, take uh, at and When do you know that's a good stock to buy instead of a bad? It's, I, you know, it's not a company I know well. And it's easy to, ha you know, I, I try not to have opinions, right, about companies that I haven't studied in detail. Uh, I would just say the debt would scare the, you know, bejesus out of me. What debt and ratios? What debt right, ratios? I don't do I'm sorry. What is there like a ratio? Like if the debt's this much, I'm not going near it. Well, for the bond funds and for the REITs and so on, I mean, you got to have debt for real estate. I we try to keep things to 20 to 30 percent leverage or below. And as you know, uh, <laughs> AT&T is a bit above that. Yeah. But I think I, you can get another thing is if for the for the 30 to 40 percent that are our closed end bond funds where we hire these managers to manage these uh, diverse bond portfolios for us, essentially, um, they CEF Connect will tell you exactly how much leverage they have. So you don't, you don't even have to go to a balance sheet, right? They will just tell you. You know, that's one of the few things I think, there's no reason that your audience couldn't pick out a few bond funds I just think putting together the whole portfolio and doing the diversification and then making sure that you've looked at management track record, uh, like you just said with AT&T, you knew this guy's history, right? Yeah. I mean, just- Yeah, you know his history. You, you know, you didn't just come to it If you get these private equity guys, you know, they're going to yeah. strip the company. They're yes. going to carton it off. They're going to find ways to financial engineer. It was just, you know, a different type of- not a Warren Buffett style of management, quite, quite no, a different one. Definitely, definitely not. And I think your, you know, your point about uh, private equity is, yeah, are there some good private equity firms out there that do this and that? They absolutely are, but they are not looking for long term. Yeah, I don't like, and most dividend pairs do. And right. I also think the reason why you need some help with this is, I, I think of. Um, just a well, a seat closed then a fund that I always follow for years, IIM. And it's just, I've been burned by it at times. I've been blessed by it at times. So you kind of know when to get in. You kind of know when to get out. If you've been following some for 10 years, because you're like, well, you know, uh, our interest rate's going to really go any higher. It's at or near. I mean, that's one I'm, I'm looking at. I'm not recommending anybody buy, but I mean, it's almost near 2008 levels. So it's like, I mean, how much worse can it get? I mean, things could always get worse, but I but I would have stayed away from that when it was, what was it, at its most recent high, you know, 17, 18 bucks. I'd be more of a net buyer when it's 10 bucks, 11 bucks, you know, just kind of the the closed end funds, you kind of kind of know, okay, when to, when to buy a new V municipal bond fund, when to not, you know. What about people who say, you hear this a lot, sometimes I think it, sometimes I don't, Bond funds are just a waste because you don't get the principal protection. So just buy the individual bonds directly. Well, I, I, <laughs> where do I start? First of all, uh, most people probably can't meet the minimums to buy them. And if we get good managers, we can get diversification. I mean, what is more opaque than the bond market, right? Uh, I don't think we need liar's poker necessarily to tell us that. But it's a really opaque world. And if you want the diversification, um, you really need seasoned managers, you know, who have been, uh, particularly when I look at them, I say, okay, they've been through 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009, they've been through 2020. Uh, I don't, I really think I'm paying for expertise. But I also think that there aren't that many people who do a, a particularly good job. Um, that's a, that's actually a good point that I never thought of. I, I would agree with you. Bond funds, 
It's not something where you want passive indexing if that's something you're doing because those managers will scoop up deals within split seconds because they'll remember, okay, I remember what happened in 08 where I was and they'll buy like 5 billion of debt in like a second. Right. No, th- th- absolutely. I'm sorry. I, am I, I just wanted to talk about sure. Jeff Gunlack. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Jeffrey Gunlack. Yeah. Gunlack's because- another one of those. Yeah. You know, they're, but it's a very small fraternity. Go ahead. No, it is. But when you get somebody like Gunlock, I mean, we own, we own several of the double line funds and does he, does he never make a mistake? Of course. I mean, he, he probably had too many Argentine bonds at one point. Right. But, um, he, his performance, uh, his commentary. I mean, he doesn't need, look, the guy's got a 30,000 square foot house in Southern California right? He doesn't really need any more money because, I mean, how much more house can you furnish? Um, but his commentary on markets, his, uh, uh, well, and his performance, you know, they're just legendary. I, I mean, he really deserves to be the bond god, called yeah. the bond god. But, and and I don't know how Gumlock traces to them, but I know a lot of the minored crew uh, right. uh, kind of trace back because you would hear him, you know, you know, say these glowing things about Michael Mulkin as a kid. I was like, isn't that a guy criminal? You know, what what did he do? You know, and I, I'm a little younger than those guys are. So I'd ask, you know, kind of pointed questions. And once you're, they all kind of look fondly to their days in the 80s, even though things, <laughs> things blew up and they all have a sharkish tendency to swoop in and get pennies on the dollar on, on certain bond deals. So that's an interesting point. I didn't connect it to why bond funds aren't a bad deal. You know, are they worth that extra expense ratio you're paying? But you would say yes. Yeah, I would say in particular cases where there's a track record, uh, where they've managed through some of the worst turmoil, where they've managed through rising interest rates and lower interest rates. You know, one of the things is everybody thinks, well, you know, if rates go up, don't bonds go down? Well, the greatest managers, uh, it's not their first rodeo, as we say in Texas. Uh, they they know these things can happen. They're managing their hedges, right? They're managing the duration of their bonds. Uh, and one thing I was going to say is I hate paying management fees, except when they're worth it. And when I'm talking about this six to eight percent, your listeners, of course, need to know your watchers um, that it's uh, it's that's after the fees. We're talking about high yield after the fees. And if you're just joining us, we are joined by Tom Jacobs, a wonderful guest. Uh, How to retire on dividends, co-authored the book with Brett Owens. We'll give that book away to those of you who call us right now at 888-988-JOSH and request your no obligation review. That's 888-988-5674. The website is howtoretireondividends.com or you could buy it wherever books are sold. Also check out Tom's work on investhuckleberry.com. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. Don't touch that dial. Tune in to the financial quarterback, Josh Jelinski of the Jelinski Advisory Group this weekend and learn how to protect your financial future during these turbulent times. Looking to lower your taxes or need help securing your financial future? Then Josh and his team are the people for you. They're experts in financial economics with one mission in mind, to protect you and your investments. From their 27-point checklist to their one-of-a-kind financial quarterback approach, they help Help you achieve financial health and guide you through the hard times of high inflation, looming recessions, and stock market meltdown. For financial security, call them now, 888-988-5674, and get your free copy of Josh's book, The Retirement Reality Check. Maybe it seems like prices can't get much higher, or that the stock market is headed for bear territory, or maybe you're worried about another great recession. Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, can help you protect your family's financial future in times like these. Tune in this weekend to the financial quarterback to hear how Josh and his team can help you decrease your tax liability and lower your risk. 
Call 888-988-5674 to take advantage of Josh's 27-point plan to achieve financial health. And when you call, you'll receive a free copy of Josh's book, Retirement Reality Check. Tune in every weekend to The Financial Quarterback and call 888-988-5674 to receive your free copy of Retirement Reality Check. So you discuss six perfect retirement plays that can pay up to 8% dividends. I think we've kind of talked about maybe three or four of them. Which ones haven't we discussed? Because I was just getting oh, in. I did the same thing with you that I did with Brett. I kind of like geeked out on dividends. Well, if we can't geek out with each other, whom are we going to geek out with, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, right. Uh, I think a particular opportunity right now is Medical Properties Trust. And it's a REIT. They own and lease hospitals. And the guy, uh, Ed Aldeg, who founded it, uh, this is one of Brett and my favorites for a long time. One of them, uh, he he found that hospitals couldn't really get financing. It was very hard for them to get traditional financing. So anyway, he came up with this model where uh, he would own the hospitals and he would lease them. And it turned out to be very profitable. But another company that uh, in this space, I'll use an example, is Omega Healthcare uh, Investors. They own and lease out skilled nursing facilities. Well, what do you think happened to these at the beginning of COVID? Everybody thought, oh, you know, uh, everybody in a skilled uh, nursing facility is going to get COVID and then they won't have any more patients and the pay so the the tenants won't be able to pay Omega their rent or the hospitals will lose uh, people in beds and and they won't be able to pay. Uh, pay medical properties, trust their rent. Well, that didn't happen. But what does happen is you do have tenants in the healthcare field that are going to be problematic, right? It's a difficult industry. And what happens with medical properties, trust, that's MPW and Omega Healthcare Investors, OHI, is that every now and then they have a problem with a tenant. And everybody freaks out and the stock drops and it's like, well, you know, it's not their only tenant. And by the way, for the most part, uh, they do a rent. Uh, they they the, the tenant doesn't go under, right? They do rent adjustments or whatever, and maybe they take a hit for a while, or maybe they find another tenant. But what I have found in years of these companies is every time they're cheap, you buy them. Hmm. And both of them are cheap right now. Oops, that's not a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. We're not recommending anyone buy or sell securities right. uh, through what we say on the radio because things might be time dependent and because yeah. we might own it. Um, so be careful, folks, uh, with dividend paying. What other warnings do you have for dividend investors? Well, if you've got a REIT that's paying out, uh, you know, they have to pay out, of, um, what is it, 90 percent of their uh, FFO in order to uh, retain their REIT status. If their dividend is, um, if if they're, all right, let me think about this. Now you, my brain's going faster than my mouth, which is usually the other way around. Uh, you want to be very careful about the sustainability of the dividend. Obviously, nobody um, paying attention to this thinks otherwise. Um, but if if the dividend keeps going up and they're paying for it out of uh, capital or they're borrowing to pay it, you know, that's that's just a bad sign. Um, and, you know, your AT&Ts and companies like that, they would uh, for years take on debt to make sure that they didn't cut the dividend. Wow. So we're having a lot of fun with the author of How to Retire on Dividends, Tom Jacobs also of Huckleberry Capital uh, Management. You can just Google the book, How to Retire on Dividends, Google Huckleberry Capital Management, or go to their website, or call us at 888-988-JOSH, and we'll give you a copy of the book for free if you keep and schedule a no obligation review. Having a lot of fun here. So closed-end funds, you talked about the benefit of paying that management fee, getting an experienced kind of bond manager, 
Uh, any particular bond managers that you're fond of today? A lot of the greats retiring or passing away. Uh, that that I guess is a, is kind of a crisis. Like Minard's not around anymore. You know, uh, some of them retiring. Occasionally, we get Lacey Hunt in who talks about treasuries and stuff. Uh, he was just a guest last week. So and that guy is that guy is brilliant. Yeah, he's 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 a brilliant man. So what do you do? You know, what, what, where, uh, who are you seeing like this guy's got it or, you know, what, how do you find, how do you know you have a seasoned manager? Because I mean, you can go to Morningstar and see, okay, this guy's been around for three years. This person's been around for 30, but they could be around for 30 and they could be a hack. <laughs> I'm just, you know, having <laughs> no, fun. no, of course. Well, you know, I love gun black and basically, you know, we own, two or three, depending on the time of the double line, uh, high yield uh, securities. And you can't do, it, it's very hard to do better than, than uh, gun lag, you know. Um, I would say what we do, and certainly what I have done is I'm looking in the CEFs on CEF Connect uh, for funds that are selling at a larger than average discount from their NAV. Uh, and then you got to say, well, is there a reason? So I'm, I'm sort of backtracking or, or adding to something I said before about the discount to NAV. You sometimes there are discounts for a reason, right? So bonds in uh, Asia Pacific might get hit, uh, emerging market bonds, and you have to decide, you know, uh, how, how serious is this? Well, if you've got a, a, a uh, Aberdeen Asia Pacific Fund, FAX, they've been managing Australian and Southeast Asia bonds for so long. They've been through everything. So, but it frequently sells at a discount. So you can't just say because it's a discount, you know, I, I'm buying dollars for 65 cents or 85 cents. Yeah. Right. So uh, I, I really cannot stress enough time in like a minimum of 10 years, and they have to have managed through at least one major dislocation. Yeah, in the high yield world, for sure. Oh, yeah, 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 and yeah, that, totally. Okay, that's great. So we're with the legend, Tom Jacobs, a wonderful guest, uh, How to Retire on Dividends, co-authored the book with Brett Owens. We'll give that book away to those of you who call us right now at 888-988-JOSH and request your no-obligation review. That's 888-988-5674. So what's up with these covered call ETFs? You like it? Okay. You're not as well, big of a fan. No, neither Brett nor I am big on ETFs in general. Okay. And that's because you can't get the discount from NAV that you can get with the CEFs, okay. right? Because the CEFs have limited amount of shares, that's how you can get the discounts. And that's how you can get the inefficiencies that you and I love. I know you're that kind of guy because I've heard you several times talk about scooping up things uh, when other people are selling them. And you can you get that with the bond CEFs or infrastructure um, CEFs. And you, you there's another thing you can get, which people don't realize. So uh, I'm a big fan of buybacks when the stock is low, right? Because if you're buying your own securities at a discount from NOV, let's say, let's NAV, let's say, let's say uh, you're getting it at, uh, you know, 20% discount from net asset value. Now, that's a lot. Um, if they go out and buy back some of their stock, well, what look at the return they're getting, right? Mm. Um, and you don't see that much in CEFs. But when the, when the discount gets huge, Really, really good CEFs will buy back their shares because it's just such a great investment. Highland uh, Income Fund just announced, I mean, they, they're selling for some ridiculous discount and obviously they want to close the discount, uh, give their shareholders some capital appreciation um, as, as, along with the yield. And they just, they're going to buy back something like 17% of their shares. That does not happen with ETFs. Wow. Uh, how do you know that's not like financial engineering? Well, when you say financial engineering, what do you mean? I mean, when I've looked deep into the balance sheets, I mean, and I'm not that maybe as deep as you and, but I always want to see, are the insiders buying? And what I've noticed with some of these um, 
REITs, BDCs, whatever, the insiders start to buy almost to like prop up their fund. <laughs> and it's like there, there. They, they became very wealthy off of this fund. Um, and it's like, well, how do you know you're not getting screwed? I guess you don't, you know, but. No, no, but I, it's a, that's a a very fair question, right? The I mean, it's one of the reasons why you got their CEFs and their CEFs. I mean, the 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 bad rap on CEFs always used to be that the people running them are basically drinking umbrella drinks in the Caribbean, right? But I think that's very unfair because some of them don't do anything and don't go anywhere uh, for sure. Um, but but to address your point. To me, if you know that the value of your security uh, is well below what it's really worth, why wouldn't you, as the CEO, allocate capital to buying those shares? It's no different than, uh, okay, I think X, X other company is yeah, a I get, good Yeah, company. I get that. That's a good Yeah, no, I know. You know that. But, but so... It's just that, you know, this is why buybacks get a bad uh, rap, you know, because I say, yeah, they're buying back some of their stock. Well, that's because so many of these tech companies are buying back stock to mask their options grants, right? And that's not what we're talking about here. But you also raise another point. You got, I mean, you got me all excited. When you talk about what management's doing, uh, on a, in a lot of these, in the REITs, for example, let's take the REITs. It's not common to see management own their own stock. And I'm sort of like, wait a minute. If you don't own your stock, why should I? Uh, but in, in the REIT space, it's it's actually unusual to see a lot of management ownership. And so we really look for that. I'm very glad wow. that you brought it up, though it was in the context of padding their own shareholding. But, you know, again, all buybacks are not created equal. No, you're right. No, I'm just thinking of some... But yeah. uh, I, I would say that the owners that I've met of those companies weren't drinking. If they were in <laughs> Miami, if they were in Miami having a drink, they were working from the beach like they weren't. They were extremely dedicated to their companies. The the few that I've met over the years, some who listen to the program, even, you know, they were very devoted people who yeah. generally. Yeah generally came from nothing, grew something really great. And then they really are keeping it afloat for their employees because they could have cashed out a long time ago. Uh, do you like private REITs or generally only publicly traded REITs? Publicly traded. Publicly traded. Yes. Oh, and, and, oh, you did it again. You got, you made me think of something. Internally managed REITs. Uh, if, if some investment person never tells any mistakes they made, don't believe them. My biggest investing mistake was I looked at management and I uh, North Star funds, uh, and they were really hot for a while, and they had good long term management. And I dipped my toe in the water, but because I said, okay, they're externally managed, but these are ethical, responsible people. But if they're externally managed, they can just lever it up and build the assets because they're getting paid a percentage of assets. And if it blows up, well, you know, so they manage something else. So I want internally managed REITs. And how do you know if they're internally managed? Oh, they say, right? Uh, are they, whether they're managed? Um, I mean, this will be on the website. You know, you might have to look a little carefully, but you don't have to read the- Oh, like uh, if they're managed by some private equity holding company or, or somebody some else, right. right. I, I a got... lot of these funds have are managed by management teams that are outside. They hire a manager uh, from outside, not in not in the company working for the no, company. I got you. No, this is great stuff. We yep. and that is just the wrong incentive. We are with Tom Jacobs, not to be confused with Tom Gardner of Motley <laughs> Fool. No, I I wasn't confusing. The I know. Two. I think I read some listener one time brought even. Did you write the newsletter for Motley Fool's investors who invested in their RIA? Or was it somebody else? No, no um, I did not. No. So Bill Mann, no, maybe? I don't know. Somebody, that, anyway, the video was, I think, or the or your voice was right, what I heard before. Okay, so we have a listener friend who's been, um, who's asked me this question before. 
So I'm going to ask you two kind of questions. Residential REITs, do you like residential REITs? And he's sort of a DFA guy, kind of investment allocation, asset allocation, passive investing. He liked the idea of kind of a passively invested or maybe even an actively invested residential REIT that focuses on Florida. I don't know if there are any that you I know of. I'm sorry to say, I don't know. I don't you know, know, the only thing I thought of was like St. Joe's, but oh I, well, I, yeah, but that's not really you know, yeah. resident. No, they they bought they bought some, you know, kind of like what BlackRock was doing. I think the interesting play is that this is a thing we won't know for ten years. What if real estate? This has nothing to do with what we were talking about, but but I figured <laughs> you would give me your opinion. What happens if ten years from now? We never see the real estate crash we're all envisioning because the Black Rocks and the whoever of the world or Blackstones with all of their private uh, monies, or they kind of bought up all of the, the glut of residential real estate. So we never have the crash we had in 08 just because there's going to be a shortage of property. Like I'm thinking of where I live right now. There's just Nobody's building new homes, so this is kind of a, a run on homes. And it's really bad for entry-level home buyers. You know, they don't have... Uh, KB Homes used to be the big builder of entry-level homes, right? Yeah. Uh, one of them. And there's just... there Land is too expensive. There is no land. Nobody is making the investments in it. Uh, it's really tough to be a younger person today looking at getting into the market. Um, but to your point, I think that's really uh, a concern because at what point do you say, well, they own all the inventory? I mean, they don't. But what, 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 as they get at the margins, they become the people that could determine how the market works. Yeah, like it could be just a bottom that was created, sort of like in New York when Nobody wanted to buy New York real estate. You know, the billionaires swooped right. in, they bought the properties and they just said, okay, that's the bottom. And then they just they just kept going up. Who I don't thought? think that's a conspiracy theory. I think that's real. No, not that. No, <laughs> no I, I just think, think it's friends. Really legitimate. You know, Blackstone has been written up for that. Yeah, I just think it's friends trying to look for, you know, non-correlated assets that, you know, right. might be. And if you look in 2012, uh, you know, Florida is probably one of the best places to buy in a generation, you know, so. Right. Well, or, or, well, I'm trying to remember now, but I, uh, I'm, I'm older than you are, Josh. So, you know, I have more things to remember. That's fun. So uh, this was a lot of fun. Tom Jacobs, the author of the book, How to Retire on Dividends. It is our free book giveaway today for those of you who schedule and keep your no-obligation review. Call us now, 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-JOSH. And they've been so generous to give us five free copies to those of you who schedule. Also, you can check out, if you like Tom, you can go to howtoretiredondividends.com or to invest huckleberry, like huckleberryfin.com. I want to thank you, a lot of fun. Tom Jacobs. Have a great day. You're the best. Thank you. You are too. Bye. The preceding program was sponsored by the Jelinski Advisory Group. Any awards, rankings, or recognition by unaffiliated third parties or publications, including Five Star Wealth Manager, Advisory of the Year finalist by Senior Market Advisor, and Top of the Million Dollar Roundtable, are in no way indicative of the advisor's future performance or any individual client's investment success. No award, ranking, or recognition should be construed as a current or past endorsement of Josh Jelinski or Wealth Quarterback LLC. Information regarding specific awards, rankings, or recognitions is available on the Wealth quarterback website at jelinski.org. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. Investment strategies such as asset allocation, diversification, or rebalancing do not assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. There are no guarantees that a portfolio employing these or any other strategy will outperform a portfolio that does not engage in such strategies. This broadcast should not be construed by any client or prospective client as a solicitation to effect or attempt to affect transactions and securities or the 
the rendering of personalized investment advice. Due to various factors, including changing market conditions, the information discussed in this broadcast may no longer be reflective of current positions or recommendations. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Josh Jelinski and Wealth Quarterback do not guarantee its accuracy, and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. The tax and estate planning information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as legal or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Investment advisory services offered through Wealth Quarterback, LLC.